Hello everyone, I am Jonathan Little for PokerNews.com. Today we have a fun hand that I played a while back at 5, 10, No Limit Hold'em. Coronavirus is happening currently, so I've not played live poker in uh, quite a while. And that's okay. We've still been playing a lot online, reviewing our hands, studying a lot, and improving our skills. And I hope you are doing the same. If you're not already doing that, head over to PokerCoaching.com. I have been accumulating many of the best poker players in the world to make high level strategy content for you. And if you are relatively new to poker, if you have not studied poker a lot already, or if you've tried um, various poker training sites and you have not had success, you may need to work on your fundamentals. So check out pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals to make sure you are up to speed. You can get a free fundamentals course there that I made just recently for you. Here we're playing five to no limit. Like I said, I'm going to be raising two three big blinds on the button with my entire playable range. If we were playing smaller stakes where the rake is more substantial, as it often will be, like for example, if they're going to take $4 out of the pot, but you're playing one two no limit, if you raise to $4 and the big blind calls, the pot would normally be $9, but if the casino takes four off the top, now the pot's $5, clearly that's ridiculous. So in those games, you typically want to be raising to a larger size with a tighter range, but at five ten no limit, usually the rake is three, four, five, six dollars $6. And if you're talking about even a single raised preflop pot that goes up to $65, if you make it 30, if they take four or five bucks out of the pot, it's not that big of a deal. And, you know, if there's a post-flop continuation bet, now the rake becomes very irrelevant. So as long as the rake is relatively meaningless, you should usually be making a three big blind raise or so. So we do make a three big blind raise. I think even smaller could be fine. The big blind calls, flop comes nine, five, two. This is a very uncoordinated board. It does connect okay with the big blind, but I typically want to be betting with my best made hands and my draws in almost all scenarios. We discussed that thoroughly at pokercoaching.com. I have a cash game masterclass there. If you are a premium member, you can check that out at pokercoaching.com slash premium where I walk you through situations very much like this. This is a spot where I don't have a ton of very obvious draws. You think about what draws I could have. I mean, four, three is the only open into straight draw. Of course, I could have 8-7 for an obvious gut shot, but whenever you kind of have a tough time finding obvious draws, you start looking at hands that lack showdown value, but have backdoor equity. That's going to be hands like Queen Jack of Spades, Jack Ten of Spades, Jack Eight of Diamonds, stuff like that. Those hands very much prefer betting because if you check behind and your opponent bets a turn, you just have to fold. You'd rather check behind with hands like Ace High that can easily call a turn bet or perhaps even um, some hands with a pair. Although that said, this is a spot where you can bet very frequently if you feel inclined. So our opponent checks. We bet $50 into the $65 pot. This may be a little bit big. Maybe we could go 40, but whatever. 50 is fine. Opponent does call, and now the turn is a king. <sighs> I didn't tell you this, but I already knew. If the turn was a spade or an overcard or an eight, I'm going to bet the turn every single time. Essentially, if I pick up any equity at all, or if the turn is scary, even if the turn is an ace, I'm going to be betting the turn, and I can already tell you, unless I make a pair, I'm going to be betting the river. And I may even bet the river if I make a pair, if it's a top pair or a strong middle pair type hand. So in this scenario, when we turn a king, now we have a gut shot. Also, think about it from the opponent's point of view. I would definitely bet with my hands like king 10, king 8, king queen probably. So now I have a lot of top pairs on my range. And if you think about my opponent's flop check calling range, a lot of that got way worse unless it includes... A king, right? So unless the opponent had king nine, king five, or king two, their hand just got downgraded from top or middle pair to now a much weaker middle pair. So this is a situation where I should continue betting with the vast majority of my range that is not a very clear marginal made hand. Like if I had a nine in this scenario, like let's say 10 nine, I would definitely just check behind and probably call a river bet. But with my hands that lack showdown value, like queen high, or if I had seven six, I would definitely bet that, right? These are all hands I'm certainly going to continue betting, and if I have a hand stronger than a 9, maybe even ace 9 or better, we can continue betting for value. So opponent checks, we do bet. Notice that range I lined out for you to bet, ace 9 and better, is pretty strong, almost certainly best at the moment, and the bluffs are almost certainly not good at the moment, right? Like this queen high is almost certainly not good, and when that is the case, you usually want to be betting with a relatively large size because you're essentially betting with a polarized range. Meaning either your opponent has the best hand by a mile or they don't. And this puts them in a very difficult guessing game. And if you can put your opponents in guessing games over and over and over and over and over again, whereas um, you know they let you have it easy and your information is very clear, you're going to make good decisions and they're going to make poor decisions. So we bet 125 and the opponent calls. Oh no, what are we going to do on the river? 
I already told you, we are going to be triple barreling this. I don't really care what the river is. The only really bad river is a nine, but even then, I'm still just gonna bet because like I told you, I can have ace nine in my range. And when a nine comes, it makes it more likely that the opponent has a five or pocket sixes or something like that that could still relatively, um, at least conceivably, be in a difficult spot if I do decide to bet the river. So when the opponent checks the river, I have a hand that lacks showdown value. I have queen high, right? It could be best if my opponent check called out of position twice with like eight, seven, but it's probably not best. So given my hand is probably not best, I need to bluff. And I'm going to want to use a relatively large size, like I would use if I did have a random two, like say I took ace two suited and turned it to a bluff on the turn, and like I would make with a king. Now, it's important to ask yourself, would you actually make this bet with a king? But you also want to ask yourself, does it matter what I would actually do with a king? Some people think it does. Some people think it does not. And in reality, it's probably somewhere in the middle because you don't know how your opponent's going to perceive your actions. If you only make a decently large bet like this with a bluff, but you bet 150 with your king, well, now if your opponent figures that out, you're just going to get demolished, right? Because every time you bet big, you're bluffing. And every time you bet small, you're value betting. So the problem with that is that you're easy, easy to play against. So what you can do is you can use the same bet size with both your strong hands and your weak hands. The problem with that then though is that you're not maximally exploiting your opponent because if you bet big with both your bluffs and your value hands, sometimes your bluffs get called and sometimes your value hands don't get called, right? So as your opponents are worse and worse and worse, and I mean, they need to start to be pretty bad for you to really vary your bet size, but as they do get worse and worse, as they very often will be in the smallest stakes games, you can adjust substantially and use very different bet sizes to absolutely wreck your opponents. Because imagine, if every time you bet 335, you only got called by a two or better, or by like maybe king five and better, but every time you bet 150, you got called by everything, clearly that's going to work out way better than if you just bet 335 across the board. But you do not know how your opponent's going to react to various bet sizes unless you played with them a ton. And I usually just don't have very many spot-on reads. And you do start to need very spot on reads to know your opponent's river tendencies because you really just don't get to the river all that often. So anyway, in this scenario, I'm going to be betting 335 with um, roughly pocket tens and better. And that's going to put my opponent in a pretty nasty spot. I may opt to use a smaller size with some marginal made hands like the weakest kings and maybe pocket 10 type hands plus a few bluffs. But in reality, in this scenario, I'm, I'm very much polarized when I do take this line. And when you're polarized, you get to use big bets. We discuss thoroughly how to go about balancing your range at pokercoaching.com in the cash game masterclass, um, especially on the river section, because on the river, you usually know pretty clearly if you have the best made hand or the worst hand. And obviously here we are presuming we have the worst hand. And you want to make sure you're not bluffing too often or too infrequently. And we discuss how to balance that range out at pokercoaching.com. So make sure you check that out. Anyway, we go 335 today. If the opponent has um, a king, they're always going to call. If they have a nine, they're going to be in a dicey spot. And if they have worse than a nine, they're just always going to fold unless they're a huge calling station. Now, every once in a while, you're going to make this bet and your opponent's going to call with ace, queen, or something like that. And you're going to say, what? And you're going to wonder, oh my God, did I make some giant mistake? And to be fair, if you're playing live poker and you're a uh, tell box, if your opponents can just look at you and tell that you're bluffing, well then yeah, you probably made a big mistake. But if you have... Um, a good poker face and you are balanced and you know, you're not lying to yourself, that you will be using the same bet size with both the nut hands and the garbage and you've done your homework and you know that we're not drastically over bluffing in this scenario, then you're going to print money in the long run. Because if your opponent calls every single time, you're just getting fully paid with your best hands, which is fantastic, even though your bluffs will fail. So that's going to be it for today. This time we do bet 335 and uh, not that it matters, but the opponent folds, and we scoop a nice pot. If you like this video, click like, click subscribe, and I'll talk to you next time.